just a brief introduction. Uh, first of all, my name is Connie Storio. I am the Migrant Justice Coordinator at Kairos. Um, this is the second webinar that we've uh, that uh, we've done so far. The first one was on March 31st, and we had about 55 uh, people joined us. And the the conversation or the theme is around you know. Uh, the impact of the current COVID-19 pandemic on temporary foreign workers, undocumented workers, and uh, refugees. Uh, at the last webinar, we had four uh, speakers, and they are here today as well. So we had Anne Whitley from uh, the Cooper Institute in PEI. We had uh, Santiago Escobar from United uh, Food and Commercial Workers Union, and also with the Agricultural Workers Alliance. Uh, Diwa Marcelino from uh, Migrante Manitoba in Winnipeg. And we had Roland and Gina Moreno from New, ba New Brunswick. I do not see um, Roland and Gina joining us today, and I've been trying to get in touch with them, but I'm not hearing back. So I think they're not able to, uh, to join us. Um, from the last conversation, we received or we heard updates from uh, the different provinces on how the pandemic, you know, is and continues to impact uh, temporary foreign workers. Uh, particularly, you know, uh, there's, well, temporary foreign workers, those who are coming in uh, to work in the farms, and also those who are already here. Uh, for today, uh, we will continue to hear updates from, you know, um, the four speakers, and we will also hear from uh, Claire, uh, who has introduced herself uh, earlier. Uh, she was the former president of uh, the Canadian Council on Refugees until from 2017 to 2019, and she is the ministry, well, from the Diocese of London, and the Ministry Specialist on Inland Protection. So Claire will basically give us an update on, you know, how the pandemic is impacting uh, refugee claimants, refugees, and protected persons who are here in Canada. Um, after, after the sharing, we would open it up for people, you know, in, in the room uh, to, to give us an update from, you know, where they're coming from. So pretty much, you know, in 10 minutes. And then we will look at, you know, what are the recent announcements at the federal level uh, with regards to uh, strengthening protection of temporary foreign workers. And, and later on, you know, we can continue the conversation on how we, uh, can all be of support, you know, to, to the workers coming in and to those who are already here. Uh, so we can start with, uh, well, we can start with the updates and I guess we can start with Diwa. Hi everyone, I'm Diwa with Migrante Manitoba. I've been an organizer with Migrante um, starting in Toronto since 2001. Uh, in Manitoba, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected uh, workers in different ways. Um, the granted mainly works with uh, permanent residents, temporary foreign workers, and also migrant workers, and also, sorry, um, and also undocumented workers. So off the bat, uh, we know that many workers in the meat processing industry, the, the industry with the largest share of temporary foreign workers, uh, has laid off uh, quite a few workers in order to keep safe distances. Uh, but we are still receiving reports that workers are still working very closely uh, with each other. And we know in the past there's been um, incidents like uh, inadvertent stabbings and cuts because workers are working very close to each other. And that has not changed. Uh, workers are still working uh, less than a meter away from each other. Uh, we're also looking at, we're also helping a number of undocumented workers workers who've had status in the past, but have lost their status. Uh, some of these workers, or most of these workers, are still in the process of getting their way back to getting their status. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, they're left, uh, um, unfortunately, they're not able to, for the most part, able to access 
federal income supports. So that's why we're calling on the government, federal government to give federal income supports uh, to all workers, regardless of status. Uh, and also healthcare to all workers, uh, regardless of status. And also, uh, we've also had a number of reports from permanent residents themselves. Um, we consider uh, workers with permanent resident status to also be precarious, like temporary foreign workers, uh, seasonal agricultural workers, uh, ref refugee claimants and undocumented workers, because many workers are still trying to find their way towards citizenship. And we often see that employers will use this uh, uh, against them and, and sometimes exploit, uh, exploit them in different ways. So in Manitoba, we are still um, seeing uh, much of the same abuses as before with migrant workers. But uh, now with the COVID crisis, we find that many are left without income supports. So that's the, a little bit of an update in Manitoba. Thank you, Diwa. Um, Anne? Sure. So um, in Prince Edward Island, um, we still don't have very many workers here. Um, but those who are here, um, there are concerns about losing income because of reduced work hours. Um, and um, I'm not sure that the, um, I, I think Connie, you've actually been maybe in touch with a few workers who've had some issues getting access to the um, emergency benefits and employment insurance. And I've heard from one or two as well that that's a little complicated. And I think that if, um, I also think that there are workers in Prince Edward Island who don't speak English and that information, I'm not sure that it's available um, in other languages. Um, and isolation is still an issue, is an issue for the workers who are here. Um, they're being, um, they're, you know, obviously a lot less mobile and um, reporting, reporting that they're not um, sort of, they're keeping, being kept very separate from other workers. Um, I just heard our <laughs> premier say on, in a press conference that he had told the uh, federal government that we don't need as many foreign workers this year, which is um, a little odd because the farmers are complaining that they haven't gotten here yet. And I know that, you know, our lobster fishery for our, all of our shellfish uh, fisheries depend on um, workers in, in processing. Um, so I'm not sure what that's all about. I think that um, we know from some of the Mexican workers who we're still in touch with, who are still in Mexico, that they want to come here, although there is some concern about what will happen when they come, how they'll be protected. Um, but, you know, this is really important. A lot of the workers who come to Prince Edward Island every year have been coming for decades in some cases. So um, this is a really uh, crucial part of their income. So I hope that we can find a way of getting them here. We did hear, I also heard the Premier say that those workers who do come will be um, undergoing self-isolation in hotels. They've booked rooms for people to do that. Um, of course, it's the employers who are supposed to make sure that all of the um, considerations around self-isolation self are, are um, taken into account and that um, workers are paid for their two weeks and that they have enough food and, and access to everything that they need. Um, we, uh, we're part of um, the Migrant Rights Network. And so as um, Diwa said, really advocating for total access to the supports regardless of immigration status um, for undocumented, undocumented workers as well. Um, and the, um, the other thing that we've been sort of uh, involved with with the Migrant Act Rights Network would be just making sure that um, those guidelines around what happens when workers get here and they're needing to self-isolate, making sure that those are um, uh, followed <laughs> and that they're monitored, that workers have a way of complaining if they feel they're not um, if they're not being paid, if they're not if they don't have what they need, if the if the um, 
if the self if the measures aren't adequate enough for their safety. And um, I think the other thing that I would say there, I, there, I can send, I can put the link on the, in the chat box, but there have been a couple of articles. There was one yesterday in the Toronto Star that I, I'm not sure if anyone saw, but it was there. There was an, some interview, an interview with a worker who felt um, that he, he arrived in Canada a little while ago in, I think, the Niagara region and um, didn't feel that he had received the information that he needed to keep safe. And um, uh, so there, there were some uh, local activists also interviewed and um, making the point that this needs to, everything needs to be completely accessible and in people's language and there needs to be more monitoring um, of these guidelines. So I think, I think that's my update. Thank you very much, Anne. I just want to add uh, a little bit because I, I've been in contact with, you know, uh, the temporary workers who are uh, who are in O'Leary. Uh, they're working at the South Shore uh, lobster processing or yeah, fish plant. And uh, in one of the, you know, the houses provided by the employers, uh, there's about um, 32 of them. And so it is, you know, it is a concern about, you know, being able to follow the, the physical distancing and also uh, them being provided with the necessary, you know, uh, health, uh, say disinfectants, uh, soaps and, and, and so forth. I was also informed that uh, many of the workers who are in that particular house uh, were denied or refused um, access to employment insurance. Um, they are expecting uh, about seven to six for that just for just that particular plant. They are expecting seven to six uh, more temporary workers to arrive soon. Although the uh, the season, you know, the opening of the season has been uh, postponed for for about two weeks, I think. Um, so I've I've connected with Anne, and you know, uh, we're planning to do a webinar with these workers in terms of being able to support them in, in accessing EI, finding out why they were refused in the first place and you know, providing that support that no, they should be included in, in you know, being able to access EI and all, all forms of income benefits for workers who are not able to work yet or that you know, they're waiting for the season to, uh, to start. Um, so that's you know a bit of an update uh, in in all from O'Leary. Um, we can go to Santiago. <clears throat> Hi everyone. <clears throat> Here's Santiago with UPCW. So a quick update um, following lobbying efforts by UPCW advocates, community allies, migrant workers have achieved. Uh, Pay protection and employment insurance the eligibility um, for those who are laid off, uh, have become ill, or have to quarantine due to COVID-19. So, meaning that you know migrant workers arriving in Canada will be paid during self-isolation. So, these are very good news. Um, in light of the fact that they would likely otherwise be working ourselves isolating for health and safety reasons and to ensure that workers can adequate, adequately take care of themselves while in self-isolation. <clears throat> so while we welcome these measures, our union is concerned that workers are not uh, able to practice appropriate physical distancing in, in their camp living quarters and, and closed working spaces. As we all know, they live, uh, they share spaces with 10, 15, 20 workers in some cases in one house. And that they may be vulnerable to contracting COVID-19. As uh, we have already seen migrant workers contracting the COVID-19 in Kelowna and now in Ontario. 
So it is a time bomb because unfortunately we have learned that most of the employers are not implementing accordingly. Uh, we also learned a couple of days ago that agriculture minister announced 50 million in federal funding to provide $1,500 per worker, uh, which can be used to cover wages while they are in quarantine or their code of space to isolate for 14 days. But it's going to be this funding goes to farmers, to employers. <clears throat> So we believe that migrant workers who play such essential role in sustaining our food supply chain should be properly compensated for their work during this uh, crisis. And this is why we are calling on the government to mandate a $2 uh, wage in increase for all migrant farm workers participating in the temporary foreign workers program and in the seasonal agricultural workers program. And now is also an appropriate time to question our reliance on the temporary foreign workers program. When we know that migrant and temporary foreign workers are critical to feeding our cities and make it possible for us to have food on our tables. So um, we, we should instead be prioritizing pathways to permanent residence for these workers not only because it's the human thing to do, it's the right thing to do, but also because it's the essential, it is essential to sustaining our food supply, particularly uh, in this time of crisis. So this is my update. Um, thank you very much, yeah, Santiago. Um, from the last uh, webinar, um, it was pointed out that, you know, we did not have much update or you know sharing on what the pandemic is you know impacting refugees so that's why i i invited uh, claire uh to to give us you know an update on how this is impacting uh refugee claimants um and also uh, in terms of you know what the ccr is doing uh claire um hello everybody um so thank you, Connie, for um, inviting me today. Um, I My work is mainly with refugee claimants, convention refugees, but often I also find that um, uh, there's a cross section between the two populations, which is the migrant workers and the refugees. So um, this is very important for me to hear those updates. So thank you. So I guess what I'm going to be bringing is just a little bit of what we know as we also just trying to learn information daily almost and we just try to cope with what it is but i guess in the forefront for advocacy um this is actually a joint call from the canadian council for refugees the amnesty international the canadian association of refugee lawyers and the bc um, civil liberties association is to is to ask the minister to reconsider um opening the borders to refugee claimants, just like with the exception with some international students and temporary foreign workers. Because as you know, um, the borders have been closed to refugee claimants. It will be a month now next week. And this really posed a, a whole lot of legal implications. I'm not gonna say what those are, but it, it is truly violating international legal obligations. On the practical side, um, on how that plays in the ground, we are very much worried that um, refugee claimants, as you, some of you may know, only has one time opportunity in a lifetime to make a refugee claim. So although we are told that if they make a claim at the border or at the regular border and are turned away, um, we were told that there's a, 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 a dialogue that they will not be penalized and will not be detained when sent back to the U.S. For sure, hopefully that is what's happening. If that's really what's happening, we don't know. And unless we find that when the borders are reopened and if they're truly allowed to make a claim and not get penalized on that one time when they already made that initial claim, we will never know. So we will always keep a, a, a very, um, we're gonna be, remain vigilant on this uh, 
particular issue because this is truly violating human rights. So that's, that is as far as, as far as the borders for COVID 2019. As far as the refugee claimants that are already here in Canada, um, but are in the process of making the refugee claim, uh, there is a process of email uh, between IRCC uh, that has IRCC has issued directives. So they will acknowledge the claim and hopefully that will allow refugee claimants to access services. Um, however, that means in this world today where there is really no frontline workers on the um, settlement advisors in their offices. So I don't, I'm not really sure how refugee claimants are going to be able to access that help. So we try, like for me, we, I try to do as much of the remote support as I can, but it is happening. They can still make a claim. If you know someone that is interested in making a claim, there is still a process um, for that. Maybe later we could share the link. There's a very, uh, a, the CCR where you can find all the resources um, and to help refugee claimants. Now for those refugee claimants who are already uh, in the system and now have to face the fact that um, they don't have now legal representation to help them during this time and they have deadlines to meet, especially with their basis of claim. That's where the actual story and the actual um, claim to, to go to the Immigration and Refugee Board, that deadline has been extended um, up to May 30th and hopefully that nobody falls between the cracks, but even though that 30th, it's, there's still that worry that if we reopen services in May 15, let's pretend to all these refugee claimants will now scram and find their lawyers and, and, and meet that May 30 deadline. So we're going to continue to watch out for those as well. Um, as far as also the Immigration and Refugee Board, especially for those that are waiting the refugee hearings, it, it, as you know, for the longest time we have refugee claimants have been waiting for so long. Um, what originally was supposed to be a 30 day and a 45 hearing process has now turned to one year. And prior to this COVID, it has been 18 months. And it was actually unfortunate because this was, it was during the time, this time that the Immigration and Refugee Board has actually now um, have utilize the additional funding that they have received from the federal government and now everything will be put to um, a, a semi-stop. Um, I, 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 I think, and this is also sufficient, that maybe they are going with some paper review. Paper review is where there's a, those cases that can actually be decided positively on paper, but not on a negative decision on paper, but still, um, this will be very difficult because some of the paper review actually requires refugee claimants to submit paper evidence. So within that time, so we're still also, even though that process is there, we are, I'm not sure. Um, another problem that we are facing and which is huge is work permits. Um, work permits for refugee claimants that have been waiting since the process, since COVID has started. Those work permits that are expiring, that you know, that what will be the directives to the employers? Will they will will they let go of these employees? But just so you know, a majority of these refugee claimants are working at the agric agricultural sector and the health sector. We have there are so many personal support workers for refugee claimants, and many refugee. Uh, it hasn't been that it's a uh, most of the work permits especially like late last year, have only been issued for a year. So those are all expand, uh, expiring. And there is really no way to, to renew work permits right now because there is a biometrics requirement as of this time and biometrics for refugee claimants is quite impossible for the majority because they don't have the identification to even complete biometrics. So that is that, but there's a like, well, the CCR, the Canadian Council for Refugees have an ongoing dialogue with the uh, Immigration and Refugee Board, with the Immigration and Refugee Citizenship of Canada and the Canada, Canada Border Service Agency regularly during this time. So we're able to really bring cases forward and see what directions we're gonna move forward. Um, the last one I think we had was April, right, right around 
Refugee Rights Day, and I know we're going to have one soon. Another one, if I have two more minutes, Connie, um, is just for convention refugees. Convention refugees are those the ones that have already successfully um, passed their refugee hearing and now actually are in the middle of the process of reuniting families. So there are many um, visas already, uh, um, travel ready family members that are about to join um, uh, refugees in Canada, but unfortunately with the International Organization of Migration also halted. Also the visa application centers where their biometrics, where they're gonna get their passports, those are also stopped. So there's a really bit of worry, I mean, a lot of worry that those visas will expire. And when those visas expire, how, what will be though, the policy for those um, visa offices? Uh, as far as moving forward. Lastly, is as far as the practical help to access CERB and the EI. It, it is very, financially, it's very, um, we find that there are many that are falling between the cracks. That's another um, sort of like basket that I'm thinking that truly are not, you know, um, just able to access any. And even those that, some that are able to have Ontario Works at least, but they're still not able to, um, to have, let's just say refugee claimants that have been here last year, they have not filed their taxes yet, right? So they don't have the GSD that is helpful to many of us. Also, I find that no matter what, um, refugee claimants for the most part have only access internet in public places. They're not able to afford internet. So what is simple to others for us to say that, oh, just apply online or even in phone that they have very limited uh, minutes on their phone. It's those pay as you go. Um, they're not able to do so. And what worries me the most about internet, though that might not be a lot, is because this is their number one sort of mental health um, um, solution because that's the only thing that they have access to families outside Canada. Without internet now, we are very worried on the mental health on those people that are isolated and totally alone um, um, living here. So that's a little bit of uh, the shortcut of what I can give you. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, it is very, very informative and and helpful for us to understand, you know, how how refugees are being impacted. Um, I just want to add uh, on the two points that you mentioned. One is the work permits. Uh, this also applies to temporary foreign workers, uh, caregivers, and you know, uh, other workers in other streams of the program. Um, Many of them have applied the permanent, uh, you know, to renew their permanent residency. Uh, no, sorry. Many of them have applied to renew their work permits. And it's been, you know, some of them had been waiting for three months and they are not hearing anything. So they are going to lose, you know, uh, the, the 90, if these work permits are refused, then they already lose, lost the 90 days uh, window to, to be able to restore their status. Um, also in terms of visas uh, to family uh, issued to, you know, refugees and also temporary workers who had already been accepted as permanent residents in Canada. So family re reunification is also very much affected. Um, visas have been issued, but because countries and even Canada is not allowing uh, permanent residents who have not landed in Canada yet to, to arrive, uh, the, the possibility or, you know, visas um, expiring and what would be the next steps for them. Uh, if they have to renew the visas, it's, still, it's going to be an additional cost for them. Also in terms of settlement, you know, uh, organizations or agencies I, uh, in Ontario, I don't know how it is in other provinces, but in Ontario, offices are closed, the agencies are closed, but they are providing skeletal staffing uh, in the office to be able to respond to phone calls and be able to assist uh, refugees, uh, temporary workers, and permanent residents who are in precarious and vulnerable situations, uh, assisting them over the phone. Um, so, so we've heard, you know, these updates from our, uh, 
our presenters. We've heard about, you know, uh, in, in the sharing, uh, many of the concerns raised are, you know, includes the ability of the migrant workers to be able to access uh, the aid uh, packages that the federal and provincial governments had been announcing. Um, this is a big concern because although, you know, on papers and in those uh, announcements, uh, they are saying that, you know, foreign migrant workers are able or are included in, in these packages, but we all know as well that, you know, when it comes to implementation, there's, there's a lot of problems there. Uh, in, in one of the bigger, biggest problems is, you know, how foreign workers can access information, how foreign workers can get support or assistance in filing for, you know, uh, for, for access. Uh, where would it go? Um, Claire mentioned that, you know, many of them do not have access or do not have personal computers or internet and they go to libraries or, uh, settlement agencies to be able to use computers and, you know, be able to apply online. Um, we also heard about, you know, how the Minister of Agriculture uh, had been assuring us that, you know, uh, the physical distancing uh, is going to be implemented by employers and that these workers are going to be paid for the two weeks that they are uh, doing self-isolation. But we already heard that, you know, some of the workers are not getting access to this two week uh, isolation with pay and also housing is still a big problem. Um, we, we at Kairos, uh, we, we are in the process of, you know, coming out with, with an advocacy letter, advocacy, you know, campaign in terms of supporting mm -hmm. those asks that despite the fact that, you know, we are encouraged by these announcements, it is very different when it comes to what's happening on the ground, like how access is provided to temporary workers and documented workers and, and, and refugees. Um, I wonder if, you know, uh, a part of the conversation we're going to have in the few minutes uh, remaining, um, if we can hear from, from you in terms of what what are you doing in in, in, in the organizations that you're in uh, or with uh, as as an individual in terms of you know um, providing assistance and an accompaniment to the workers who you know are in your communities? Um, I could start, I guess. Um, we're. I think at this point, we're really just trying to keep in touch and um, uh, with workers who are already here and um, and be open to supporting them in whatever way they need. Um, but I think also the advocacy is really important and making sure that those programs are accessible and um, because the barriers, obviously, you know, as you, you just really outlined those perfectly, they're they're worse. They're 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 more significant right now um, in terms of communication and, of course, the condition, you know, around housing. Those things were bad to begin with, and and they're going to and it's worse now, and with very serious implications for people's health and well-being. So, um, I think as much as that that's kind of where we're at to largely it's advocacy getting in touch with our mps sharing information on facebook um and and sort of mobilizing the sort of community of people who have some connection with workers who are here so that they just keep in touch thank you Anne. um in in p i i i um I know that there is uh, there's a group of Chinese speaking workers who are you know both working in fish plants but also in 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 the farms. Um, I met some of them and a lot of them do not speak English. So it is you know it is a big uh, barrier for them to one understand what are they entitled to. Uh, and 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 also how how they can you know express uh, what they're going through the exploitation and 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 
you know, need that they are facing, the challenges they are facing. And I guess this is also uh, true to other provinces where, you know, um, those working in remote communities are not able to, uh, to speak the language fluently. And, and feeling very isolated and, and, and feeling, uh, feeling detached and not supported. Um, other, other places? Um, if I may jump in. Uh, as um, UFCW and the Agricultural Workers Alliance, we have a toll free and also we have social media vehicles. So, <clears throat> We are trying to spread the word because we have seen that a lot of migrant workers, they don't know how to prevent, they don't know what to do if they contracted the virus, they don't know, you know, uh, procedures. And also oh, I think it's important to coordinate with um, sending countries. So our, we are in contact with <clears throat> the government of Guatemala and Mexico. So we're coordinating with these governments too, as a lot of migrant workers are calling, especially from Mexico, because they don't know uh, what's next. They don't know if they'll be able to uh, travel to Canada this year or not. Or, you know, in, in many cases, they already got their flight tickets and, you know, they were they couldn't they couldn't fly to to canada so we are also uh, providing assistance to these workers and uh, for those that are that you know want to try the employment insurance uh, benefits because just to mention a uh, a farm in the simco area they stopped working because of the covid-19 so these workers apply and we will see how it goes after the next couple of days and also those who are experiencing abuses we still assisting these workers to apply to obtain an open work permit as vulnerable workers so we are the good news is that IRCC is still processing these uh, work permits and um, yeah that's all on my end thank you Santiago I'm wondering Pastor uh, Father Peter um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in a unique position because I've got, uh, on the one hand, uh, contact with the migrant uh, workers. I mean, not that I've seen many in town, so they're just coming in a little bit at a time. But I'm also in touch with, uh, with the farmers. So uh, I know that we, we know there's many examples of you know uh, tough situations or unjust i could say that at least for my community and I'm, I'm only talking about a a handful that i know from my church the farmers are very good to their workers from what i and i've been there they treat them humanely and they themselves don't have all the answers either you know they're trying to get the information because everything is changing evolving and and so forth so yeah, so I see them uh, making an effort. Like the other day, one of the farmers asked me, uh, uh, I, I need to, you know, can you help me uh, put some, uh, like a little package or a little instructions for them? And I said, well, I said, there's a YouTube video put out by the migrant uh, worker community, and it's actually bilingual. I don't know if anybody's seen it. It was uh, made by the, uh, the Ontario Provincial Police. And it's bilingual in conjunction with, with the uh, farm worker, uh, migrant worker community. It was well done. Just the basics about the COVID, the, the, the crisis, uh, health being quarantined, washing their hands, so forth and so on. And also where they can, in general, where they can go if they have any concerns. So that's one sort of assistance. But you're, you're right. There needs to be a lot more information sharing and, and then we have a, a lady here who uh, is kind of becomes a, kind of a conduit of information because when the, when the workers are here she has a little business of helping them transfer or 
uh, send back money back home. So right now she set up a kind of a um, on the WhatsApp chat because guys have been asking, say, what's going on? How's the situation? We don't know. So yeah, there's still a lot of uncertainty. And aside, coupled with uh, even before the pandemic in this area, there are already uh, some cutbacks uh, because of uh, international trade, whatever. So there, uh, you know, things that were going on beforehand. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a difficult situation right now. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I just like to, if if Anne has um, pre-prepared letters that have have gone to MPs or could go, or post to Facebook, that would be great to share on the chat or afterwards to everybody because it I think that would help kickstart us you know to to move ahead on this and the same thing with other links that Santiago had mentioned and and so on that that would be really helpful thanks Suzanne hi Catherine hi how are you I'm good I'm in the the uh, Beamsville Vineland area and we oh. have 203 workers at the moment, uh, 30 women. And I'm one of four churches involved in uh, an organization to help them. And if before the virus arrived, we were having, um, having dinner uh, every Sunday with all the workers. Mm -hmm. And of course now we can't do that. So um, at this point, uh, one of the churches is delivering food every week, uh, fresh bread and buns and cakes and to the workers, but they're, they're lonely because they miss seeing each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, Catherine, are you with the Anglican Church? Uh, with the United Church. Oh, with the United Church. But yeah. the Anglican Church, St. Albans, is the one who really organized this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they... Um, I'm going to try and get someone from that group to come on the webinar. Yeah, and, and, and Catherine, if you know, you can have a worker join us. Um, that might be difficult because... They are working? Or yeah, they're, they're working. Yeah. Or they feel, you know, uh, threatened or, yeah. No, I... Comfortable. I yeah, they wouldn't feel. I think it would be difficult to get them in here, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. get them to join in because they are at work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The timing is not yeah, yeah, uh, conducive for them. Although we are trying to organize webinars, you know, uh, to to just for workers uh, to have a forum where. Uh, they can, you know, they can share uh, information, but also to break the isolation. Yes. Uh, so that they would feel they're connected, even given, you know, uh, the current situation. But being in a webinar and seeing other people and talking about the same issues, I think, you know, that would help them as well. Uh, yeah. So I'm organizing one with the workers in Limington in Kingsville. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I just spoke to Anne, and we're organizing one as well in, you know, for the workers in in O'Leary or in PEI. So okay. maybe you can help us organize, you know, one for the Bimsville area. Are most of them Spanish speaking? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. they are. Yeah, we can we can bring in uh, Alfredo. Oh, and Shannon, you you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> We'll get in touch with you in terms of, you know, how we can and when we can, you know, organize this webinar to reach out to workers there. Well, I will speak to one of the other organizers and we'll see what we can do. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, four minutes uh, remaining and um, I guess, um, what is very important, you know, in the conversation or this in this webinar is the ability to be able to share, you know, information uh, uh, on the ground and also looking at what 
each and every one of us are doing in terms of being able to support directly or being, yeah, uh, the affected uh, workers, refugees, and the vulnerable um, community. And, and also finding, finding support in how we can, you know, we can do things both at the community level and at, at the federal level. As mentioned, you know, earlier, um, there's a lot to do in terms of making sure that, you know, uh, any of the policies or, or action that the government uh, is doing in response to the pandemic, in response to uh, providing support uh, to people who are vulnerable and precarious, that, you know, uh, we follow up and we make sure that these are implemented and that we become, um, I wouldn't say the third person, but we become the bridge, you know, between the implementation of these policies and those who are, those people who are needing uh, the support. Uh, we are all rooted in, you know, in our organizations, in our communities, and, 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 one of the strengths, I guess, that we can do is really have our eyes and ears open in, in, in you know, making sure that both the workers are protected and that the employers or the farm owners are abiding by the measures that, you know, the guidelines that both the federal and the provincial government have put in place in ensuring the protection of, you know, uh, the, uh, the temporary workers. In, um, in the next, you know, webinar, I am hoping that, you know, we would be able to invite uh, farm owners uh, to share, you know, what are the challenges they they're facing and also to hear from them how they are implementing, you know, these measures. And, and also from, from directly, you know, inviting an agricultural worker or workers in terms of what they are experiencing on the ground. Not to, not, you know, uh, to have these two groups face to face and, and uh, possibly open to, you know, um, conflict or anything, but really in terms of making us understand where are the gaps and how can we, how can we jump in and be able to support both. Uh, we already, we've been saying that, you know, farm growers and migrant workers are important in ensuring that there's food security, uh, that, you know, the food supply in Canada is not impacted, but our need should be consistent to, you know, uh, promoting and respecting the human rights of everyone, especially uh, the workers. One thing also that I'm looking at, or we're looking at at Kairos is, um, how our personal support workers or health workers are, you know, uh, surviving or coping with these challenges. They, they are in the front lines in terms of providing uh, support and care to, to infected or, you know, uh, um, people, especially those in the nursing, you know, or long-term health, uh, health care or facilities. Um, so these are the, you know, these are the two, th two things or two topics that we want to explore in, you know, uh, the next, uh, the next webinar. Uh, we've said in the past that, you know, we're doing this every two weeks. I don't know if that is still, you know, um, a go for the people who are in, in the call right now and and yeah, and, and, and if we can also just get a brief feedback in terms of how you find this webinar helpful and useful in, you know, in our common understanding of what is happening and where we can jump in to provide support. I guess I want to, yeah, I want to close, you know, uh, the, the webinar with a note or, or thoughts from, you know, uh, from participants in terms of how you find this useful or helpful. I think this has been really very valuable and um, I'm not involved directly, but hearing the things that are possible to be involved in, I, I agree with, I think, Anne who said, if you were to post 
the possible kind of letters and things that would be really helpful to me. And I've, I've learned a lot today. So I hope to come back in two weeks time. Thank you. I also want to say, this is Claire, I also want to say, you know, I think this is very helpful. Um, I think it is very understandable that we all learn as we go along. There's nobody, nothing has prepared any one of us to this kind of situation and much more to the people that we're trying to help and serve. So the more information we have, I think that's, uh, that's, that will be our weapon to, to move forward. So anything like this, um, thank you to Kairos for organizing it and looking forward to joining you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Claire. This is Linda from Hamilton. I, um, I found this invaluable. I learned a great deal. And um, I certainly support the idea of looking at the PSWs and what's been going on for them. Um, I think this is a really critical issue and uh, it's been going on a very long time and I think what the virus has done is helped us um, begin to realize the injustice that's been going on in that system for a very long time. So thank you immensely. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Yeah, thank you, Linda. I guess in that note, uh, we can, you know, we can say um, we, we close the webinar and, and again, thank you, thank you so much to, uh, to Santiago, to Anne, to Tiwa, and to Claire for providing us, you know, updates uh, from where they're coming from and the work that they're doing. And for everyone, you know, for, for sharing your thoughts. And, and, uh, and you can always, you know, connect with us at Kairos in terms of uh, what, what you can do, how you can support, and also, let us know how can we, you know, continue the work that we are doing. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.